So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome and uh, am excited to hear from Dan Wilt. Wow, oh, bless you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Harmony and, and Jimmy and Sandra. And, um, you're so generous. Uh, I really do feel like uh, part of the part of the the UK family, and especially uh, within that that sort of immediate family of the worship leading community. Uh, so it really is a privilege to spend some time together. And you know, this medium I've I've noted, I was uh, on a, a Zoom retreat yesterday leading worship it was about 200 uh, Methodist pastors and just noting the vulnerability when a person is speaking and you're just listening in your alone room and yet you know there are a lot of people with you right and the chat helps that facilitate it but it's a new world uh, we truly are in an utter disruption in the church we're in a disruption in our culture, in our societies uh, uh, worldwide. In the U.S., with all the other layers that we've been going through, this is a true disruption. But the the, the fascinating part of, a, of words is that they can mean many things. And, and I hope today I'm going to use some of the same words that we'll use uh, in everyday worship language. But my prayer is, is that we catch the new meanings and the fresh meanings behind them. But the word disruption is a uh, often considered a negative word. It means you stop doing something, something interrupted you, something paused you. But when you go to the business world, it's the word that's often used for innovation. It's a disruption. It's a sea change. It's a moment that will be looked back on as a historic moment because something was going on. And that's what I believe is happening right now for all of us around the world, particularly related to worship. I won't use much time here to, to talk about the mechanics of what we're all doing, how we're all figuring it out, the, the hoops we're having to jump through, uh, how successful some of us are being and how uh, some of us, I'm watching worship leaders around the world hanging their head, feeling like they should be doing it another way. And I won't get into some of those things, but I hope when we get to some Q&A time, we can explore what we need to explore based on, on what I'll share. But I really want to leverage this medium to have a heart-to-heart -heart with you, if I could. This is less a workshop and more. I'd like to speak to you particularly as a fellow worship leader. So we're having a, having a, a libation here, you know, across the table, a coffee or whatever we're having. Um, and, and I want to share with you from the heart because something feels like it is a coal in my heart. And it's catching me on fire. And it feels like it is an old word in the worship community that is a now word for us. Because particularly, I've titled our time, um, I'm going to look at it exactly what I said, the gift we bring to this moment, vineyard worship in the new reality. And I could have easily titled this what the world needs now, but I want to speak to this gift we bring because there's something endemic, systemic, uh, deeply in our DNA as a movement that is exactly, in my belief, what the world needs now related to worship and its leader leadership. Uh, in this conversation, you're going to hear me being indifferent to the stages we're on stages in a church where we're filming or stages in a small environment or, or online stages. I want to be indifferent to those for a minute, not because they're not important, but because I think they are mattering too much to us and they're becoming a distraction from what the world actually needs now and where we need to be spending our time and energy and, and focus. So ride with me, if you will. Uh, again, the heart to heart is kind of one sided. We're getting just my talk in, uh, in the conversation across the table. But I'm going to ask you just to, to let questions simmer, let them come into the chat. We're going to give as much time as we can uh, at the end to sharing uh, some things together. So where I want to begin uh, is really in a prayer that we would rediscover a gift that is in who we are as a movement that is sort of like, if you've ever had the experience of 
someone taking a gift that you already have, and yet they take it away and rewrap it and represent it to you. Um, I've had that experience once, and it was it was funny. It's like I know this thing, but they wanted me to reclaim the joy and the specialness of what this this thing is, because the truth is, over time, familiarity. Hearing the same words can create some level of numbness to uh, to something fresh that needs to to come about. There's there's an old quote I've always loved: "The art of travel is not in seeing new places; it's in seeing old places with new eyes." So there's going to be some sense of of a bit of old school I'd like to take us to, and yet my prayer is, and the feeling in me is, it's got the fire of that 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 fresh prophetic call to us as the worship leadership community to reclaim something very precious, but to do it in some new ways. How many of you have found that all the the, the tips and tricks and things you've learned all along the way, you've had this new world, a new reality, sub-reality under God's great reality that remains the same, uh, Todd Hunter, who uh, lives about 30 minutes from me right here, he's the, he was the former you know, Vineyard National Director in the U.S. He's now uh, uh, the Bishop of, of the C4SO Anglican world here. And he was just saying the other day, he said, perspective, guys, this is my father's world. Nothing has changed in that capital R reality. But in the small R reality, we are in the froth, right? We're in the fray. And so... So we come to this moment, uh, we come to this moment with, with great vulnerability, we come to this moment, and I believe one of the things that God is doing is he's, he's calling for some things that we need to refresh ourselves on, reclaim, and I'm going to uh, become very practical in saying there are some, there's something for us to do, and I want to actually end this with a challenge to you that I'll offer, no one's going to be following up. But I'm going to offer it because I'm enough of a pragmatist to know that we can hear more great theoretical teaching, words, one-liners, that's great, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it is how we do the details of our life that determine the destiny of a soul and the legacy of faith that we leave along the way and that we leave as we go forward into the, the new heavens and the new earth ahead. So... Um, I want to dig in. If you've got a, a Bible in front of you, I'd like you to open it to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're not going to spend a lot of time there because of, of all I want to get through, but it's going to be a reference point. And this is going to feel, for any of you who have been leading worship as long as I have, you're going to go like, wow, this is going right back to those kinds of times. And we used to talk about these kind of passages with all sorts of passion. And then Sometimes we've moved on because we think we've learned certain things. And, and there's a fascinating passage here in 2 Samuel where uh, David is bringing the ark back to what is called the city of David, right? It's going to be called the city of David. He's going to bring it back with him to his home because the ark in the image is the presence of God. It is the nearness of God. It is friendship with God, if you will. It is intimacy with God. For the Jews at this time, they see all the way back to Moses, who is having his face-to-face -face encounters with God. The covenant love that's been pursuing them their entire history is captured in this, this image that is less a symbol and more a what we'd call a sacramental object. It's something that actions are performed around. It's not just a picture of something. It actually is something connected with how they do worship. And, it's, and it images the presence of God with them. It images God being before them and them being before the Lord. It images this face-to-face almost naked, unveiled encounter. And David says, as this worship leader, I'm going to use him just, just in that picture, all of his life, the God he experienced out tending the sheep, the God he experienced in his kingly leadership, the God he experienced writing these guttural passages in the Psalms, so powerful, so vulnerable, so honest, so poetic and beautiful, and yet strikingly abrasive at times. David is coming to this moment, and he just basically says, 
I can't do this because the image, the face-to-face -face experience with God is essential to who I am as a leader of this people, whether it be as a worship leader, as a king, as an influencer, as a, as a spiritual guide. It is so integral to who I am, and it is integral to this new day, this disruption that the community has been through. We must encounter the Lord face to face. We must go, think back to these old school ideas, not of singing uh, about God, but of singing to this face-to-face -face intimate encounter. Now, even as I use the word intimacy for a moment there, some of us, and, and I say this to myself as well, we think we know what we all mean, that we all mean the same thing. I'd like to press some buttons and pray that the Lord helps us maybe see some fresh layers of meaning behind what it actually costs what it actually takes to be intimate with God afresh and in a new season to reclaim it so that there is a very precious gift that we give to people in an online stage, in an, in an upfront stage. And that gift, my deep belief is, is exactly what the world needs right now and is crying for and it's difficult for us to hear because we're busy turning knobs and moving cameras when we need to be moving our own hearts in the heart of God. And that is what is going to give us this key, and it is spiritual authority. And I'm going to expand this definition. What the world needs now is spiritual authority expressed in spirit-responsive worship leadership. And all what the world needs now in a worship leader, in you, in me, is spiritual authority expressed in spirit-responsive worship leadership. And that word responsive is going to be very important. So in this passage, in 2 Samuel 6, we know the story. David's bringing it back. Somebody dies. David gets angry at God. He says, I'm not willing to take it home. He puts it in Obed-Edom's house. And Obed-Edom's house is blessed. The ark is at his house. He's blessed. Someone says, David, the presence of God is with Obed-Edom. This isn't right. We have to get this back. David says, all right, let's go. We could die, but whatever. I need the presence of God. He goes. He gets the ark. They start coming into the city, and David sees that nobody died, so he's happy. But David begins to do something. And he begins to do something that we glance at and we sing about. Matt, you know, Redmond wrote a song about it years ago, et cetera. Undignified. We see this whole thing. But we have to get the content behind the form. And I'll share why in, in a second. David begins to dance before the Lord. My guess is David was dancing. David was singing. David was shouting. David was doing very David-esque things. And, and all the women... The men, the children, it says there were 30,000 men there, but that was just a category. Now they're adding on women and, and children. So there's a lot of people in these throngs coming in. And David is a king, doesn't have all, all his garments on. He's got this, he's got his linen ephod on. He's dancing like a crazy man. And clearly it's getting out of hand. And, and Michal, his wife, there's going to be some marriage lessons here, but we don't have time for that part is looking on in disdain from her window. She is not in the worship gathering. And she is ticked because she knows how a king leads. She knows what a king should look like. She knows what the optics should be. She knows what the resolution should be on the camera. She knows what should be plugged in to get the best audio for your online service. She knows how the stage should be set up. She knows how the persona, she knows what you should be wearing, how cool your guitar should look, what the tone should be. She knows who should be with you and how the, like, she knows the details, guys. She knows it. And what we have is David looking like a silly man in front of everyone as he unveils his heart again before the Lord. And let's just go to the encounter here. Chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 20. So David finishes with everyone. They're all celebrating. David returned home to bless his household, to just out of the overflow of worship, to bless his household. 
And Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him, and she said, Oh, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. Okay, this is total cynicism. This is mean-spirited. This is, this is Michal knows how this should look and how this should feel. She's got this down. And David says something in response that we have to note. And there are three words in it. There are three words in it that are the very gift that the vineyard movement and vineyard worship has been to the churches of our time. And God intends to be in the future vision of the church that he has and why we are here for such a time as this. David says to Michelle, it was, and here are the three words, before the Lord. Before the Lord. I just want to let this sit a minute. It was everything I did, Michelle, was before the Lord. Unveiled, face to face. God's comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with it. There is an intimate knowing here. I don't need this to be about the polish. I don't need it to be about the production values. I don't need this to primarily be about the songs we were singing and the words we were using. Michelle, straight up, the Lord and I have an open, veiled relationship with one another. And I am glowing because of it. And it was before the Lord that I did this. Now, it's interesting in this chapter. I just, I underline them one, two, three, four, five, six times this phrase before the Lord occurs. And he says this, I, I think this is, this is good for marriages, right? When you say the thing you need to say, walk away, don't add to it. And David added to it. He's going to add to it twice. He says it was before the Lord. And there's this beautiful moment. And then he goes, I got to get a dig on, at, at her. She just, she just harmed me. That just hurt. So he says, who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house, by the way, when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. And then he gets his composure again. He gets the composure. Okay. Sorry, sorry. And then he says, I will celebrate. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified. Now, just take that word again, unpolished. This will not be about the mechanics and the production values and how I look on the, on the Zoom lens and how I look in Facebook Live and how we do this and how it looks in front of everybody, et cetera. Now, you got to hear me, guys. I love high production values. I, I love it. And I've been in small churches. I've been in large churches. I've been the worship leader, the worship pastor, the worship designer, the worship space creator, whatever it is. I've been all those things, and I'm not saying the things that, that I'm, I'm talking about aren't important, production values and the details. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm saying there's a problem. We're putting them in the lead. We're putting them in the lead, and my perception is, and guys, I say this with great humility. Again, this is a heart-to-heart. -heart. I'm looking out over the world, and I'm not just watching vineyard stuff. I'm watching the wider church, et cetera. I, this sounds, you know, discernment is, is, there's a fine line between discernment and judgment, <laughs> right? And we always want to walk in discernment so that others discern things about us and can say things straight to us from, from a prophetic word. I see a lot of worship leaders who are leading songs. I see them in some settings that have a sense of the spirit and awareness leading songs with a, a sense of great stage awareness of how to lead worship in a spirit-touched way, how to do a vamp, how to have a prophetic word, how to sing, et cetera, et cetera, how to have, have in some ways, and I'm just going to, I'm going to say this, you'll, you'll know that I mean a lot more. I would explain it. I'd talk about it, and I don't see myself as the epitome of it, so I, this is something I aspire to in this, but I'm seeing a lot of still even online, stage-centric mentalities in worship leadership. What happens when we're in front of people is where we're primarily cultivating the skill of being a worship leader. And 
I'll qualify it in a minute. Let's finish here. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be, Michal, humiliated in my own eyes. And here he gets another dig in. David, don't do it. He did it. But by these slave girls you spoke of, by the way, all those pretty ladies out there, they're going to hold me in honor. Deal with that. You know, and she's like, oh, boom, you know. And then, of course, you hear this old woman say, and Michelle, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Right. <laughs> anyway, fascinating story. But here's the thing I want to say about this. I personally believe, given the Psalms, given all the dynamics of Israel's history that then moves into the life of Jesus that is built on this whole story of covenant pursuing love, loving kindness, the word hesed that is so unique and strange in the ancient world, loving kindness, covenant love, this over and abundant, unveiled interaction, David's life moves through it. It's through the songs. Jesus comes on the scene, embodies it. Paul, rooted and established in love, knocked off his horse by love, becomes this thing. The New Testament church is, is enmeshed in this long thousands of years of love, story, intimacy, comes to us now in this moment. And this is what I want to say. I believe that David was not doing anything in public that was not already a very normal, normalized, steady part of his private life before God. What happened when his door was shut was finding evidence and overflow in what happened when he was in the public place. Now, let me fire through a number of things here so that we can, we can spend our last 15 minutes or so uh, interacting a bit. I've been around for a while. I, you know, as Harmony said, it's been 30 plus years. I've been leading worship, still leading worship. I'll be leading worship, you know, in the, in the old folks home. I'll be leading worship, you know, they'll let me. Um, but I've been leading worship for all that time. And that put me back at some of the beginnings of the contemporary worship movement. And of course, records and things were starting. I was a little later. I wasn't like way back at the beginning, but I was kind of coming, et cetera, et cetera. And I spent a lot of time observing because that seems to be something I'm, I'm called to do, just to observe and then to reflect back and maybe find the Lord in it and see if there's a word for us in it. But I remember observing worship leaders that I had great respect for. I sensed when they led worship, something important was happening in the room. I felt pastored. I felt like something was going on. Many times I felt, and I'll use this language again, that they were washing my feet as a worship leader. That they had a towel around them and they were bowed down. This was not about them on the stage, even if there was elevation physically involved. This was about we in the room. This was, was sweet. But here's the thing I did is I spent, I know, hundreds of hours interviewing worship leaders. And one of the common denominators, the golden thread that ran through so many of those conversations was the rich, vibrant, consistent, calendared in, planned time that many of these worship leaders were having alone with God, ministering to the Lord in worship, interacting with the Lord in worship, learning how to ebb and flow with the Holy Spirit, how to sing their prayers, how to sing the scriptures, how to discern what the Lord was taking them to and beginning to start singing something and playing something. And another thing I noted is in some of those conversations, we were talking about how that sacred space was not even always a songwriting space, that every idea that came to them didn't get jotted down, and then they worked on the song, and they crafted, and how will this be arranged, and da-da-da-da-da. They actually just left it there as an offering before the Lord. It was just the way they did it. And I remember in those days, that was very central to my life as a worship leader, I would have at least, at the very least, an hour a week, at least an hour a week, where I just get before the Lord with a song, and I just begin to worship, and I'd sing, and I'd sing my prayers, and I'd be silent, and then I'd be on my knees, and then I'd be on my face, and then it would be the scriptures would be open, and God would begin to speak to me, and I might jot something in my journal that because I want to remember it, but I wouldn't let that distract me and pull me out of just lingering 
And I remember these moments, guys. I just had one the other day, which is so precious to me, of just sensing the Lord's glorious presence, no matter what we're going through, just brooding over me, brooding in that place. Now, I, I have a deep theology as, as well of, of a sense of the absence of the Lord. And that, that comes, you know, uh, from, from many church historic writers um, that we have those experiences. Um, the dark nights of the soul, St. John of the Cross. But when I look back at that time, I remember in that time, the Holy Spirit coming to me in a moment when I was in one of those prayer times uh, one of those secret place times, which is the language I'll use. And I, I sense the, the Holy Spirit say this to me, Dan, we've come too far as a, as a in this worship thing together. And I'm going to have you leading over the years. And you guys could add up your own experiences leading. I'm going to have you leading thousands and thousands of people. And so he said, so here's what we're going to do. To the degree you rise and fall in your secret life here with me, to that degree, you're going to find your physical, emotional, even mental health impacted. You stay in the secret place. You make this the epicenter of your worship leadership. And you don't ask ever again for favor with me, with any person, with any congregation, with any, you only ever ask for favor with me. You don't ask me, I, I don't know if I said that right. You don't ask me for favor with other people. You only pursue favor with me. And you make your secret life with me in worship, with your instrument in your hand, lingering in my presence, learning my ways, being responsive to me. You make that your epicenter for worship leadership, and you will have favor with anyone I want you to. You will lead with spiritual authority. You will deepen. You will grow. And this won't be about all the teaching you're hearing, and it won't be about your, your hundreds and thousands of hours of experience leading worship and leading people and all these sorts of things and all these accoutrements that we know are important, but they are not the epicenter. You are not going to draw your strength and your spiritual authority from those things. You are going to draw it from me in the secret place. And guess what else I'm going to teach you, Dan? I'm going to teach you how to hear my Holy Spirit when you're playing your instrument. And I'm going to make it so that instead of your instrument playing you or the music playing you, you are playing your instrument. You are playing the music. And the music is not in the lead. And the production's not in the lead. And the arrangement's not in the lead. And all these other elements are not in the lead. Your heart, your secret life heart is leading. And that can never be compromised, Dan, or you're going to begin to feel much of you, your life being compromised. Now, you have to hear, I've been in and out of that my whole life. In the last two years, I've gone through a, a, a very disturbing, disorienting, disrupting season of health issues. I've been in and out of the hospital, heart issues, nervous system issues. I mean, I can't even begin. I had, had, had Beyond the heart thing, I had two surgeries this year, ripped all the muscles in my shoulder. I'm still recovering in therapy. Yeah, just But two years of pain. When you're in searing pain and moments even, I remember three weeks of insomnia I went through. Bless you. The Lord heal you and help you if, you if you're going through insomnia. I remember in those moments feeling like I could lose my mind here at 2 a.m. I could literally lose my mind. Where are you now, Lord? Here I am on my knees, dying, psychologically unable to think a coherent thought in these moments. Where are you? Heal me, deliver me. And I remember just these nights on my knees. It was like, if I could have, honestly, guys, I'm letting you in now. This is the heart to heart, right? If I could have torn my clothes, if I could have shouted in the middle of the night and not woken up my wife and, and anyone else in the house, right? Visiting, that's a great way to, to handle visitors, screams in the night. It's it's just a thing. It'll, it'll really bond you over time. But um, these dynamics were going on and I was like, I don't even want to touch my instrument. I stopped worship leading except for a few moments for extended months. I might have done it two or three times maximum. And finally, even just a few months ago, the Lord said, Dan, I want you to take your place again. 
I want you to take your place. And I immediately thought, guys, after all these years, I immediately thought, okay, take my place. Online, leading worship or, or, or leading worship live, or what, what, what do you want me to do? Is, is that as a teacher? Is that, what is this? What, you know, I just felt arrested, pulled out of the game, pulled to the side, pulled just, just like, what do I even have to give? I'm, I'm aging in pain, Lord. This is, <laughs> it's hard to sing, you know, when you're, when you're physically like <laughs> dying up there. And the Lord said to me, Dan, have I been with you this long? I'm not asking you to take your place on some stage. I'm asking you to take your place again in the secret place. Take your place in the secret place. Take your place in the secret place. And this, this surging word just came up in me. If you want to take your place as a worship leader with spiritual authority in our time, you're going to need to first take your place in the secret place and get serious about it, get focused on it, get attending to it. Because in my view, when a worship leader is leading online, on a Zoom call, on a webinar, on whatever tech you guys are using, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, et cetera, et cetera, and they are mechanical about this, or there's some sense of rigidity, or they were just used to a stage, but now they're on a stage, et cetera. I'm just telling you, and this is where I'm going back to, you know, discernment versus judge. I'm not trying to judge anyone, but I'm just telling you, I just feel like there's a lot of lack of discernment of what's going on in that 30 minutes they have to lead worship, that we've gotten really good at a lot of things, and we we have passions. We have things we care about. We want to make it look good. And then we're all oh, this music online and we need to compare ourselves and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, guys, this is all just noise. Pull this curtain back. That's what Jesus did when he died. He, rend, he tore that curtain, tore this curtain back. What God needs is worship leaders who no matter the format, as they are leading in a song, they have logged in over a lifetime hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hours of just knowing where to go with the Holy Spirit and when to say the Lord is bringing healing right now. There's someone here with a, a mental health issue and anxiety. Gosh, do that, guys, and you're going to win. It's going to fill the chat, right? <laughs> anxiety. Is there anyone here? I have a ministry of the obvious. You know, anyone here with uh, blue eyes? Is there any, you know, but I'm just saying discernment, all that comes the thing that I saw in those early times was all this content of intimacy with God forged in the secret place. And what I began to see then as the industry took over is hundreds and thousands of worship leaders mimicking the form without having the content, without that deep substance and thinking that when they were planning their set, when they were doing the logistics, when they were writing the song, etc., that that was the same thing as their secret place life with God. I'm just telling you, don't confuse it with anything else. It is not the same thing. It is not the same thing. That place of worship with the Lord is where the, the prayer happens, the intimacy happens. It's where the encounter happens. It's where we learn to discern the ways of the Holy Spirit. We are going to need to develop forums where people can come and we can wash their feet in worship. And many of you are doing it. Many of you are emblems and ensigns of this. Guys, way to go. Thank you for the healing prayer rooms. Thank you for this. Thank you for having teams whose whole job it is, is to pray for people in the Facebook live stream as worship's happening. You know, people doing in instrumental nights, just healing hours. Come, we'll pray for you, whatever it is. You know, there are so many different creative things, but I'm telling you, a worship leader looking at their music is not that. A worship leader, and, and you'll hear me, right? I'm always kind of, I don't want to have to caveat everything I say. You know what I'm saying? There is experience that matters. There is fluidity, but where is that fluidity learned? It's learned in the secret place. A fluidity that takes the song, one song, and responds to the Lord with it over a period of time and begins to develop our spiritual hearing. We practice praying for people and hearing the Lord and getting words, and we get better at it. That's deep in our vineyard genetic code. You got to practice this Worship leaders narrow it into our role. We have to practice being responsive to the Spirit on our instruments 
in the secret place with the door locked, audience of one, no one to impress, one song, maybe moving in out of two or three, singing our prayers, being silent, being on our face, all that sort of stuff ends up in leads to spirit responsive worship leaders. And you know what? There are, I'm sure, tens of thousands. I don't know how many worship leaders there are on planet Earth right now who look to us to model it, who look to those who are in more, more open to the spirit, charismatic, Pentecostal, vineyard, other traditions. They're looking for it. And we bring this intimacy. And I'm just telling you guys, we talk about how our songs need to be in simplicity and complexity and all that. Guys, I'm just telling you, I can, I, I personally, I know you, you know, you can too. I can lead a complex song in a spirit responsive way that lingers over a phrase for a period of time, whatever can lead a simple song that way. And I think we do need different types of songs, but it still is about the mechanics. They matter, but they don't matter as much as this. They don't matter as much as a worship leader who is secret placing in their life. Now, this is just the, the challenge I want to offer to you. And we're going to move into, into Q and a here in, in just a minute. So, Harmony, if you want to, and Jimmy, if you guys want to get ready, and Sandra, here's what I want to offer you. I'm going to, I'm going to call it the one, 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 one challenge. Okay. Uh, we don't have to call it a challenge. Just this is the principle that I think will help recover this and will begin to bring spiritual authority back in. God, this is the only thing we'll take across with us with us over the line, our relationship with God. There is nothing more important than this. And if we're going to be worship leaders of God's people, just as other leaders in their worlds need to develop their skill set, our skill set, I just want to declare again, is not primarily or only music and production and having some sense of connection with God. And, and I met with God and had some prayer time and did some quiet time. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about an hour at least a week. Ready? One hour, once a week, for one month, and here it is, one song. You get one song, and you can move in and out of it. Maybe there's some other phrases from other songs or a chorus or whatever, but don't let only the music as it's sung dominate that time. Linger in it privately, alone. I'm going to ask the Lord to give you the space and the place to find it, the time, the zone. I've had the privilege, the Lord has been gracious to me, where I could get really loud. I could get soft. I could do things. I could lock a door at least, even if I couldn't, you know, if I was afraid of someone hearing me, what would happen in that room. But I have shouted and I have danced before the Lord and I've bowed down. I know many of you have, but this is the thing I want to say. We have to recover it, and we have to recover it with consistency, and we have to actually believe it is in the lead, and it is what the world needs from us right now as worship leaders. It will translate on any stage, online, live, anywhere. It will translate. It will bear the fruit of great songs. It will bear the fruit of phrases that the church needs to, to hear. It will bear, bear the fruit of learning how to pray afresh and working out all those kinks so those more mechanical things start to fall away as we start to find our way into those fires of worship again. If we're called to take our place in this time, we have to take our place in the secret place first. May the Lord take some of these same ideas we've heard before and help us lock in. I'd encourage you to take the next month and get that hour in at least once a week. And if it bleeds into more, great. But there's no songwriting that happens in that time. You can jot an idea down. You have permission. But don't get lost in it because it'll take you another place in your mind, in your heart, thoughts of, wow, this could be the big one. <laughs> Not that any of you ever do that or us ever do that, right? It will distract. Let these kill. Let your best song ideas be an offering to the Lord that just dissipates into His heart. All those things are just absorbed into your relationship with God, and you'll take it across the line with you, and it will be behind you. It will be the gravitas, the weight behind when you're singing that same chorus you've sung a hundred times, and they're singing it. There will be a weight 
called spiritual authority behind you as you lead worship. We have to recover the secret place. 